Well, hello there. You're listening to Mr. Gale. I'm uh, making this little video from Canada. It looks like I'm going to be here until about the 14th. So until then, uh, you are going to be learning through uh, uh, another teacher. And uh, I hope to see you in about two weeks. But until that happens, I wanted to make this video just to give you a little uh, help in getting started and making sure that you you have a good idea about what's coming up, that kind of thing. So uh, let's just get started right away. Um, I want to talk to you about a few things. First off, uh, you should have in your hands today um, or maybe tomorrow uh, a course outline. Okay, so I have something I sent ahead that should give you a basic idea of what to expect as far as the chapters coming up. Um, you'll also notice on the outline that we have uh, basically everything divided up into the test quizzes, midterms, and assignments, plus the final exam. Uh, take a look at that because your tests are worth quite a bit. The quizzes are not worth very much. The quizzes are really only there to make sure that you know what you are doing. It's not, they're not going to contribute very much to your grade but it's to make sure you know what you're doing. That's really the idea of quizzes as opposed to tests. Uh, if you also look at that, you'll notice that there is no textbook. Now, there is a textbook to use. It is the uh, Stuart 7th edition uh, calculus textbook, and I have provided it for you for free. It is a PDF that I have located on the website that has my stuff on it. Now, I know normally that you have a website uh, on QQ from the teachers, but I'm not there yet and I haven't set anything up, so I'm not ready to put everything on QQ, but I already have a whole bunch of stuff on Edmodo. Uh, Edmodo looks like uh, this. This is, this is an Edmodo site. Uh, here's the calculus site here. And as long as you have the uh, the website address and the password which I have passed on to your teacher so you can get the password and the address from them uh, you can get right on this right away I, I invite you to please get on this as soon as you can and uh, as you can see there uh, I'm going to post things as we go through the course and uh, let you know about things coming up that kind of thing and as well you'll notice that there's a folder section and I will have a folder for every chapter, but right now there's nothing except this one here, just called General. Now that will have in it, we'll just open it up here. First off, you can see it has the textbook. It has, um, down here we have the course outline, which you should already have anyway, and as well a diagnostic test. Now you're going to be doing this diagnostic test for the next uh, two days following. Uh, this is to make sure you know everything that you need to know before we get started in the real calculus. And I'll explain that in a second about why that's so important. But just so you know, the tests that you're doing in the next few days, they're not going towards your grade. They're a kind of test to make sure you know where your weak spots are. Uh, it's very important to be able to know everything you've learned up to this point. And you may have forgotten some things. You may have said, oh, I don't... You know, I really don't remember trigonometry. Well, now's a chance to go back and make sure you do. So what I've also provided in this folder, you'll notice that we have here these review sections. This is for you to look at if you find that when you did the diagnostic test, you didn't quite know how to answer uh, certain questions. So make sure that when you do the diagnostic test this next two days, you're doing it on your own. You're not getting help from anyone. It's not going to help you to get help from anyone. You want to find out what do you know. Okay, so make sure that you keep to yourself. Just just see where you're at. Okay, and, and it's okay if you don't know everything. It's uh, important, though, that once you find out what you don't know, you do something about it. And uh, you look up the things that are missing from your knowledge. Now, before uh, I go any further, just remember the Edmodo site. That's there for you. Uh, something for you to go through. Uh, the textbook is there. I think that's everything. Um, so why don't we um, just have a brief moment to talk about uh, calculus. So today I want to talk about the big picture. 
Okay, so what, what I guess we gotta back up a little bit and we have to ask ourselves, okay, what 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 is math? Now this is kind of an interesting quote by a, a very famous man named of Rene Descartes. And Rene Descartes uh, said uh, very famously that each problem and I solved became a rule which served afterwards to solve other problems. And this kind of builds upon the idea that what 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 is math? Math is uh, a house. You can look at math as a house that needs to be built. And how are you building this house? Well, you build the house based upon what you already know. You start off with arithmetic. You learn some algebra. You get into geometry and trigonometry. And calculus is where you're using everything you've done in past courses, all the math you've learned up to this point is going to help you and you, well, it's going to build upon what you're going to do in this course. You must know all these things in order to do calculus. It's, it's really what we're trying to do. It's the foundations of the building that we're trying to create here. So let's, let's talk a bit about what we already know and why where does calculus fit into it? Now, when I did calculus, I did calculus in university. Uh, and by that time, well, what you're going to notice about university is that many times uh, you don't have so much teachers. You have professors. And professors like to, they like to lecture, but they don't often like to explain things in detail to you. They expect you when you're going to university that you're already an adult, you already know everything that you need to know, and they don't have to answer silly questions. Now, thankfully, you're in high school, and you can ask me as many silly questions as you want. I am happy to answer them as much as you throw them at me. So please ask questions all the time. Um, but what I found when I did uh, calculus is that nobody told me uh, what the hell I was doing. They didn't explain why we were doing calculus. You know, what was the whole point of calculus? I just learned how to do it and I just did it and I got the right answers, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so that's what I want to talk to you about is really about what, what are we doing? What, what is calculus? And it's actually quite simple. It's actually a, a few simple problems. So let's start off by looking at something. Lines, otherwise known as linear functions. A straight line function, uh, we all know certain things about them. In fact, let's talk about the things that we already know about lines. Okay, well, um, we know how to get the slope. And if you recall, the slope is created by the rise over the run. This is stuff you've done for years now, so you should really know this stuff pretty easily. But ask yourself, okay, uh, how do I get the slope? Oh, that's the rise over the run. Uh, and... Uh, in fact, if I get the rise and the run and I have one point, uh, I can create the entire equation for that linear function. And so it's pretty simple to do. Uh, what about the length? Well, um, I can always look at this as being something where I have a, uh, I, I can sort of like, let's look at this point right here. I have sort of a triangle being created by this slope line. And if I want to talk about the, the length of the line or a line segment, it's really the, the hypotenuse of this right triangle. So uh, the way I, I look at it is I have this, this, this right triangle being created by any kind of two points, and I can find the length of that line. And uh, what if I want to do the area under this line? Well, that's, uh, well, let me see. Let's um, think about from, uh, let me actually draw this here. I'm just going to draw this very quickly. Um, let's say I had a line. Uh, how should I do this here? Here we go. Uh, here's my axes. I'm going to draw this really simple. Here's my axes. And then I have, uh, let's see, a line whoop, like that. And then if I said, okay, hold on. What is the area under uh, the line from this point to this point? Well, you would go, okay, let me see. Uh, the area under that line is a combination of, well, if I look at it, it's a combination of a, a rectangle here and a triangle here but overall i can find out the area under this line it's it's not that 
difficult because I know how to get the area of a rectangle, length times width, and I know how to get the area of the triangle, length times width times uh, a half. And I can add these up and I can get the whole area under this curve. So simple. And there's not much to it. And, and so that doesn't seem to be anything that I don't already know how to do. It's not, it's not difficult stuff. So when it comes to lines, we're having a pretty easy time. But what you want to ask is what happens when I'm dealing with curves? Now, in, in the case of curves, that could be there's a few different types of functions. There could be quadratic functions, uh, cubic or or higher power functions such as a uh, quartic or quintic functions, or to the power of seven. What would that be? I don't even know the name for that. I want to say sept, but it's not sept. I don't know what it is actually. Oh, that's bad. I don't know things. This is a bad thing. But anyway, we also have exponential functions, radical functions, these kind of things. They're all involving curves. And so let's ask the same questions. Let's ask, do we know all the same things that we know for lines? Uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, so how do I get the slope? Well, the slope is always changing on a curve. So it's kind of a weird question because I can't really say, well, what is the slope from, say, uh, let's look at this graph here. Um, what is the slope from, say, 0 to uh, nine, I would say, well, it's, it's sort of like upward slope, then it's kind of a horizontal slope, then it kind of goes down again. So what is this? Uh, do I add up all the slopes? No, I mean, I can't really talk about the total slope of that line because it's always changing. So I can only talk about what is the slope at exactly, say, x equals, I don't know, negative three. I could look at this and say, oh, okay, I, I kind of know what the slope of that point would be because I would be looking at the tangent, the tangent to that curve right at that point. So slopes are really different. Uh, I, I can't, it's not as simple as just saying, oh, rise over run. It's not rise over run anymore. It's the tangent line. It's the slope of the tangent line. Um, now, what, what about the length? Um, how do I get the length of this curve? Well, I, I have to figure out some way of sort of adding up tiny bits of the line like I could or I get a rope and I kind of measure along here and I can estimate but how do I get the exact length of this line maybe from say x equals 8 to x equals negative 5 uh, how do I get the length of there I it's actually kind of difficult when you start to think about it. and what now here's the other thing is what about the area under the under this line say I said what is the area from uh, let me let me go back to this. We're gonna do this again now. Let's uh let me see what we got here. Hang on one second. I wanna I wanna change some colors. I'm gonna pop this on. Beautiful. Let's try again. Okay, so where's my where's my pencil? Here we go. So let's draw another happy little thing here. Mm -hmm. Alright, X and Y. And then I'll draw I need a new color. Let's see, where's my colors? Oh, blue, oh, blue. Okay, so let's say I had a curve, whoop, like that. And you said, okay, um, what if I was trying to find the area from this point to this point? Okay, so I'm looking for the area under the curve. And you go, okay, well, before I was making rectangles. And I guess, well, wait a minute, okay, I've got a, I've got a rectangle here. So here's a rectangle, so that's length times width. But then I've got... Well, wait a minute. What is this? This is, it's not a triangle. It's, it, it looks like this. How do I, how do I do that? How do I get the area? What, what's the area under this thing? How do I figure that out? And that's when you realize you don't know how to do this. I mean, this is not, you could sort of say, well, it sort of looks like a triangle. In fact, maybe I could say it's made of like a whole bunch of um, little tiny bits. Maybe there's that bit and that bit and that bit. And I could keep adding up little tiny bits, maybe something like that. But I'm not getting a perfect answer. How do I get a exactly what is the area? Exactly what is the area under this curve? And then I realize I don't know how to do that. I've got to figure a different way of finding that out. And that is really the whole point of calculus here.
Calculus is working with curves and figuring out how to determine the slopes of the curve at a certain point and the areas under a curve. These are things that you have no way right now, you have no way of solving unless you learn calculus. And those are the two problems that calculus is pretty much obsessed with. Now, what is that a is that a big deal? Like what what's the big deal? Like what an uh, entire course asking to answer two questions and you ask yourself, well, that doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Is that really something I gotta do, you know, a whole year of math to figure out? Why is this? Why are curves so important? Well, take a look around you. Take a look. Okay? What do you got? Well, you got a lot of furniture. Take a look at some of the furniture around you. Hmm, it's got some curves in it. Most of the time. Not all of them. I mean, you see your average chair, it's some of it's just a little big blocky thing. But take a look around. You're going to notice there's quite a few curves in the world. What about architecture? There's a whole bunch of architecture out there that doesn't necessarily follow straight lines. A lot of it does, but not all of it. More of the some of the more beautiful buildings out there actually involve some really neat curvature to its uh, shape. Look at when we build uh, textiles. If we're dealing with anything that has fabric that has to follow a curved shape, our bodies are not exactly made of flat planes. See that baseball cap? That's because your head is one big curve in three dimensions. And you've got to build something that goes around a curve. Look at the front of that baseball cap. That's a beautiful curve. How do you figure those things out? I mean, you can fake it. You can kind of estimate. But is there a way of figuring these things out exactly? What about space? Did you notice that everything in space is curved? The planets are all made up of, like, uh, well, basically spherical shapes. They're, they're curves themselves. They follow along curved paths throughout space. In fact, just just uh, for those of you who are doing physics with me at some point this year, space itself is curved. So, in fact, I mean, what we're saying here is that uh, curves are kind of more common than almost every any other kind of shape. So, calculus becomes really, really important if you plan on working with any of these things. So, just something to think about. Now, Really, to fully understand calculus, we're going to have to start talking about limits. You've done limits to some degree, hopefully, but uh, in calculus, we're going to really get into it. We're going to really try to like talk about it a lot more because limits deal with infinity. And infinity is really kind of like where limits become kind of interesting. And and you know what? This this was a problem from a long time ago. Uh, consider somebody named Zeno. Zeno, that's X-E-N-O. Now, Zeno uh, created a paradox. Uh, he suggested this thing. And he said, okay, listen. Uh, assume there's this man. And he's uh, standing in a room. And uh, he has to walk to the other side of the room. So here he is. He's going to start here and he's going to go to this end of the room. And then we're going to ask ourselves is, okay, um, he moves forward. Boom. And first, in order to go forward, he will have to move half the distance. Okay. So he's moved half the distance across the room. And then what does he have to do? Well, uh, he has to move half of the next distance, okay, well, half of that distance, that's, well, that's actually half of a half, so that would be a quarter, right? But he's moving half of the distance that he's got to now travel. And then after that, well, he's got to go half of that distance. And, uh, well, half of a quarter is only an eighth, so he, he'd move an eighth of the total distance. And, and then what would he do? He Well, he'd have to move another half of the distance. He, he can't go all the way. He has to move half first. So he'd move half of that distance, which is half of an eighth, which is a sixteenth, and on and on and on. And so what you have, uh, according to Zeno, he'd say, well, you would never, ever reach the end of the room because you're always needing to reach half of the distance and there's never going to be an end to it. 
you can keep going half, 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 half. And obviously the distance are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but you're never going to reach all the way. Um, another way of looking at it is asking yourself, well, what is the sum of one half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty second plus a sixty fourth into infinity? What do we do? How do we solve that problem? And so what we're going to be starting off with when we um, deal with this course is how to solve the problems of limits to infinity or limits to a certain number. How do we solve this? Um, does is half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus sixteen plus one thirty second plus one sixty fourth equal to one? Or is it equal to something less than one? Or what is it? What is the answer here? How can I prove it too? Because remember, that's pretty important. We don't want to just simply have an answer and not really know exactly why. We're talking about proofs here. So this is kind of the, the basic idea, but it's not just that that we're going to be dealing with. When we talk about calculus and we're talking about slopes and we're talking about areas underlying, there's a really good thing uh, a really good example that you can refer to uh, when talking about this, and that's, uh, well, people running. In other words, kinematics. In other words, physics. Physics, now I, I teach physics, so I'm obviously going to be bringing this up a lot in our class because it's the best example to use when you really want to understand um, where this gets used a lot. Now, if you've ever done physics, you've probably... Um, taking examples of uh, people running. Uh, here's a, a nice picture. Of, look at that guy right in the front. There's Usain Bolt, the current uh, um, gold medal uh, Olympian who's the fastest man on earth. He is clearly ahead of everybody else. Man, that guy is fast. Anyway, um, what's interesting is that if you want to follow the path of Usain Bolt as he runs, he creates a certain type of curve. Now, um, let me see. Hang on now. I'm just going to move this a little bit. There. Now, I've created two curves. Now, this is the actual curve of uh, someone made of Usain Bolt's running. Now, you'll notice that um, this is what we call a displacement time graph. It's showing where he is um, at a certain time. So, he ran and by about, looks like he made it, what was it, 9.6 seconds. At about 9.6 seconds, he passes the 100 meter line. So, but you can also notice that this is not a straight line and you wouldn't expect it to be. You would expect him to start off. Now, if he was running, he's going to start off um, probably starting at zero. He's not going to be moving very fast, but he's going to speed up pretty fast. And then when he finishes running, he's going to slow down again. And at a certain point, he's going to be running as fast as he possibly can. And he probably can't go any faster than he already is. Now, if you look at that, there's something kind of interesting. Because when you look at the curve, you go, well, wait a minute. The curve kind of just like it's it the slope changes really quite a lot there for the first two seconds it's it's kind of like a horizontal slope and then it suddenly whoosh it's now that and and you think well wait a minute what is the slope of this line like if i picked any kind of slope um it, it's basically rise over run and rise is distance and, and and run is time and so the slope is distance over time well how do i what is distance over? Well, that's speed. Distance over time is speed. So over here, I've got a map of the speed of Usain Bolt. Now, this is taken from this. Now, the, I, I'm saying V here for velocity, but it's basically the same thing. For those of you who don't do physics, uh, I use the, the letter V in place of S for speed. And you can notice like what the speed starts off at zero, of course, because he hasn't started running. And then suddenly, after two seconds, he's now running at roughly 10 meters Per second and he runs and he kinda, kind of speeds up a little bit towards the end and then slows right down back to zero because he's past the finish line and now he's going to slow right down and if you look at this the question is is there some relationship between this graph and this graph is there some way that one can be created from the other one what can we learn from both of these can we figure out average speed can we figure out what is his speed like if i look at this graph i can say well okay the speed at three seconds is roughly looks about 10 looks like it's about at 
10, 10 meters per second. So if I look over here, I'm looking at this, I have to ask myself, how could I get the speed from here? How do I get the slope of the curve here? And then I could even come over and say, wait, the slope of this is going to give me the height of this curve at that point. But how are they really, how can I relate them? And this is where calculus makes this really, really easy. It looks difficult now and you're thinking, oh, I don't really exactly know how I would actually create both of these. Trust me, once you know calculus, it becomes pretty simple. It actually becomes dirt simple. I mean, you're going to have a lot of fun with this at a certain point because we're talking about how do you map a changing sloped line? The slope is changing all the time. How do I map that? How do I describe it? And this is where calculus becomes really important. So what am I trying to say here? Well, let's have a quick summary. There's two types of calculus, okay? Curves and slopes. So what it says here, differential calculus. Now this is what we're gonna be dealing with first and probably dealing with for most of the course. And this is concerned with the rates at which quantities change. Now, what does that mean? Well, rate of change. Let's go back again. What is rate of change of the slope? Well, rate of change is distance over time. I'm talking about the slope. I'm talking about speed. So another way of saying, for example, for this, the rate of change is the speed, the way in which the speed is changing and so you're still talking about the same thing here. It's a study of the rates at which quantities change. So the rates of change and slopes of curves. So differential calculus is only concerned with how do you figure out slopes of curves. That's it. That's all you're trying to do. And then what is happening right here? That's what differential calculus is asking you. Right here, what's the slope? What's happening right now? How fast is that person going? Right there. If this was a distance over time graph, you'd say, well, what is the speed right here? You could figure that out if you know differential calculus. The second type of calculus is known as integral calculus, and it's completely concerned with the area under a curve. How do I figure out the area under a curve at any point between two points uh, on a graph? So what's it say here? It's concerned with the inverse of this, uh, the accumulation of quantities. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to listen to, but trust me on this one. So for example, what am I asking? I'm asking you, what is the area, this whole area here under a curve at this say, for example, from this point to this point. How, how do I figure out the area under here? That is what's known as integral calculus. That's exactly what you're going to be up to. That's um, the only two questions really that calculus asks. So now that you know this is all you're going to be doing, you can kind of like go, oh, oh okay, I, I guess I could do this, or at least I could, at least I know now what the hell I'm trying to do. So differential calculus, trying to figure out the slope. Integral calculus, trying to find the area. Because we have no idea what to do when it's a curve. This is really what you're going to be doing in my class. So um, have some fun before I get there. I will see you soon in about uh, two weeks. And uh, I hope uh, everything goes well until I get there. And uh, if you have any questions, of course, uh, you want to talk to me before I get there. I do have my email on the course outline, so you are welcome to contact me anytime you feel like it. Um, I look forward to uh, possibly seeing you very soon. Okay. See you later.